So our first speaker is, uh, is Jody Banks from uh, Purdue University. Um, there's, this, there's this great uh, marginal note that, uh, that Darwin made in his copy of a book called, the, what's it called? Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. This is kind of a book I think that uh, Rick Santorum might have liked, um, <laughs> which, uh, which sort of was pre-Darwinian and sort of described the scale of nature and how there were lower organisms and higher organisms, and of course we were at the, at the, at the top end. And uh, Darwin made this, this uh, marginal note where he said, never use the word higher or lower, <laughs> higher and lower. Uh, and that's really hard to do, and Darwin himself really had a hard time uh, doing it. Uh, you sort of have to train yourself not to, which is what he was trying to make a note to himself to do. And uh, we're going to hear this morning about the, the lower plants, which is really a hard phrase not to, not to use. It's very complicated. In the plant world, there's a lot of... Uh, plants that are lumped together in this, in this category. They're either plants that don't have, uh, that are sort of non-vascular, or they don't make seeds. These are things that are not commonly associated with the vast majority of the diversity of plant life that we see, that we see today, the so-called higher plants that are mostly plants that reproduce by making uh, seeds. And uh, Jody Banks was our, our first speaker. She was the one who really kind of recognized early that sequencing the genomes of some of these our early diverging lineages of plants, the ones that don't have the higher categories, would really get, tell us something about uh, how those higher categories of plants evolved. And so we're fortunate to have Jody telling us today about uh, the genome of Selaginella, a remnant of an ancient vascular plant lineage. Boy, this is great starting off this session. I'm usually put in the odd, weird organism category, which always ends up being at the very last uh, series of talks in many meetings, along with people like study sex and hyenas and kangaroos and things like that. So this is great. Um, OK. This is a cartoon of a ovule of a Arabidopsis. And this ovule surrounds an embryo sac, the female gametophyte. And in, in one of those cells within the gametophyte is an egg. So I think a goal of botanists and developmental biologists is to understand how this egg, once fertilized, has its genome, right, ends up looking like this. OK, so a developmental biologist who's interested in flowering, for example, and there's many people who study flowering in Arabidopsis, would like to look at the genome and understand all of the genes that are necessary and sufficient for driving um, the development of this particular flower. Okay. So an alternative to just focusing on a single individual, okay, and understanding developmental processes, one can also use evolution. So this is Chlamydomonas. It is a green algae. It's a single cell. And what I'm really interested in is understanding how over 600 million years of evolution, um, we end up with something that looks like a walnut. OK. So we can really use genomics here big time, right? So this genome, obviously, if we're interested in flowering, obviously would not have the genes to, say, make a flower, whereas this genome would. So using a comparative genomics approach by having lots of genomes, you know, the idea is that we can associate genes that come and go through plant evolution to try to understand innovations in plant evolution. OK. Now, for this approach to succeed, you need two things. You have to have the genome sequences from evolutionarily diverse taxa, right? And the second thing is you have to really understand evolution. So if you study Arabidopsis, and only Arabidopsis, you know, you're, you're going to be very limited in how you think about using evolution to understand these processes. OK, so I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about plant evolution, 600 million years in just one minute. OK. All right, so basically, um, and of course this is an oversimplification, but there are, major, there are four major groups of plants that have ever lived on this earth. And I'm talking about green plants here. There are the green algae. They are. They have a haplontic life cycle. There are the bryophytes. <clears throat> there are the lycophytes. And then there are the euphilophytes. So really only four major groups of plants. 
All right, so what I want to do is just point out some of the major transitions, the major innovations that have occurred through this 600 million years of evolution. Okay, so here we have chlorophytes, which would be Chlamydomonas, and then the caraphytes, which are thought to be um, their ancestors are the plants that actually crawled up onto land and colonized land, okay? Now, in order to do this, several things happened. First of all, the plants acquired a cuticle, which is this waxy covering that helps plant, prevent desiccation of the plant, okay? So cuticle is really important. The embryo, okay. So these algae are haplontic. So as soon as the zygote forms, it undergoes meiosis. Okay, so algae, these algae never figured out how to divide mitotically, okay. So all of these plants are considered embryophytes because the zygote divides mitotically to give you an adult diploid multicellular organism, thus giving rise to the alternation of generations, which all the animal people hate to even think about. Um, there evolved gametangia. Now, gametangia are important because these are sterile cells that surround the gametes, the egg and the sperm, okay? And then the other major innovation was sporangia, which is another sterile jacket of cells that surround the developing spores. Okay. So with all of these things, plants were able to um, survive and then thrive on land. And it's thought that the bryophytes, the ancestors of the bryophytes are the most closely related to the very, very earliest land plants. Okay. All right, so about 450 million years ago, Plants evolved vascular tissue, okay? So bryophytes have no vascular tissue. All of these plants do have vascular tissue. And what is vascular tissue but ligni um, lignified xylem, okay? And they also, this diploid phase of the plant life cycle just pff, took off. And the reason the diploid sporophyte was able to increase in size was because of the evolution of vascular tissue, because it provides the pipes, you know, to take the water from the root of the plant to all the way to the top of the plant. Okay. So without vascular tissue, the sporophyte phase is always going to be very, very, very small, which it is in the bryophytes. Okay. So at the same time the sporophyte starts getting bigger, the gametophyte actually gets smaller. And there's a reason. Now, gametophytes do not have vascular tissue, and there's a reason for this, and that is that the gametophytes of all of the plants, except for angiosperms and a couple of gymnosperms, make flagellated sperm. So the gametophyte, which produces the gamete, right, always has to be on the ground very close to water or rain, raindrops, okay, so that the sperm have a medium by which they can actually swim to the egg. So the gametophyte has this aquatic legacy that the sporophyte does not. All right, and then once plants evolved um, vascular tissues, they seem to have radiated into multiple lineages. Most of them are extinct, but two are extant, okay? One lineage would be the lycophytes, and the other lineage includes the euphilophytes, which I won't go into the, what these words mean. Um, and in each of these two lineages, leaves and roots evolved here, they evolved there. Of course, then within the euphilophytes, you get the evolution of seeds, which is the retention of the gametophyte, da 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 and flowers. Yeah, flowers, okay. So here are some, just briefly, some of the major innovations that are associated with the evolution of plants. Okay, so, Today I'm going to talk about the sequence of Selaginella, which is one, which is a lycophyte. It is not a fern. A lot of people confuse ferns and lycophytes. In the old days, it was referred to as the as an ally of a fern, but we now know, based on molecular data, that the lyco, that ferns are much more closely related to angiosperms than they are to lycophytes. And lycophytes. Um, have a very ancient orange. They're, they're, they're at least 450 million years. You can follow the, you can see the fossil record for lycophytes. It goes way, way back. 
and they were dominant during the Carboniferous uh, era. So this is a artist's rendering of what the Carboniferous looked like, and these are lycophytes, and also some basal ferns. Okay, so the Carboniferous is a time when you know, carbon was actually fixed, and it was due to these lycophyte-dominated forests. So the whole atmosphere, actually, of the Earth changed because of the lycophytes. So they fixed carbon and released oxygen. Um, and then this is kind of cool. This is a coal mine in Illinois. So there was an earthquake, and the roof of the mine fell down, and it exposed this carboniferous forest. So this is actually a, I'll go over here now. <laughs> so this is the tree trunk of one of these large, large lycophytes. Okay, so when you burn coal, you're actually burning these lycophytes, right? And now releasing the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Okay, so there are only three groups three families of lycophytes that are extant today. One of them is the Selaginellaceae, and um, we sequenced, or JGI sequenced, I should say, I didn't do it, um, Selaginella molendorfi. And the reason it was chosen is because it has a very small genome. Um, some of these other lycophytes have very large genomes that are well over 50 gigabases. They're huge. But it, as it turns out, this one has a very, very small genome. So this is Selaginella growing in the greenhouses at Purdue, and then this is actually Selaginella molendorfi growing in nature. It's actually growing in the cracks of rocks. Okay. This is what it looks like. Now, all of the lycophytes have in common these microfills. Remember I told you these leaves or microfills evolved independently in the lycophyte and then in the euphilophyte. Lineage and these little leaves are really small. They're only about three millimeters in diameter. So you can see why they're called microfills, right? Small leaves. They do not reproduce by flowers, but they do produce a strobilus that has sporangia and gives rise to the other part of the plant life cycle. Now these plants have not learned how to branch laterally. They only branch at their tips. They bifurcate. Okay, so there are those of you interested in roots in Arabidopsis. They, these plants never figured out how to, how to do that. So you see this bifurcation tip growth in all of the lycophytes. Now, the people who were responsible for not only just sequencing, assembling, and annotating the genome, these, these are the JGI people. And here's a big shout out to Igor. Is Igor here? Where's Igor? Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. I bugged him a lot. He's great. Okay, so these are the JGI people responsible for that, and then all of these other people um, looked at their favorite gene families, and each one of them came up with a pretty interesting story from the Selaginella genome sequence. Okay, and what I would like to do now is just mention one of these stories, considering I'm a JGI, and the story I'm going to talk about is lignin. Now, there's a couple of other talks hear about how to get rid of lignin, and I'm going to talk about how to make lignin and how this pathway evolved. Okay. So lignin is the second most abundant polymer on Earth. I think it's second to cellulose, which is used for biofuels. It is a major component of the plant secondary cell wall. Of course, it's present only in vascular plants. It's, it plays a very significant role in sequestering carbon, right? Plants use a lot of carbon that they fix and put it into lignin. It yields more energy than cellulose when it's burned, um, but it cannot be converted into fermentable sugars, so therefore is not a really good um, source of biofuels. Okay. So, when JGI started sequencing Selaginella, I was talking to my next door neighbor at Purdue, who is Clint Chapel, and he studies lignin biosynthesis in Arabidopsis. So one of the first things they did was to look at the lignin content of Selaginella, and they found that Selaginella, like angiosperms, makes syringeal lignin. Okay. So 
Most plants, well, all plants make guaiasal lignin, but only the angiosperms at that time were thought to make syringal lignin. And I'm not a biochemist, but the difference between the composition of the lignin is a big deal as far as the ability to degrade lignin for whatever reasons. Okay. But Clint noticed that um, Selaginella actually makes syringal lignin, okay, which was very interesting. So <coughs> Jinka in his lab um, wanted to know how Selaginella happens to make this particular type of lignin monomer, okay? Now, lignin, okay, these are the lignin monomers. This is the G guaisal lignin, this is syringal lignin. It is synthesized beginning with phenylalanine through the uh, phenyl poly, uh, phenylpropanoid pathway, which is really, really, really complicated, and I've just indicated here with a yellow line, okay? So there are two enzymes that are responsible for making G-lignin and S-lignin. One is F5H, it is a P450. Um, it adds a hydroxyl group here. And the second enzyme is COMT, this is a methyl transferase, so it adds a methyl group there. Okay, so Clint had um, done a lot of research. He actually cloned these genes and characterized them in a Arabidopsis. So Jenka decided to look for these genes. Now we have the genome sequence. Look for these genes in Selaginella and um, find out if they are indeed present, okay? Especially the COMT, which is involved in making S lignin. Okay. So in addition to cloning the genes, doing the rescues to see if they, these genes could rescue mutant phenotypes in Arabidopsis, um, Jenka made recombinant protein of the Selaginella Molendorfi F5H, this P450, that hydroxylates, and the Arabidopsis F5H, and, and looked at the enzyme kinetics of these two proteins and asked, you know, are they the same or are they different? And what he found was that for some substrates, you can see the, the uh, this is KM, right? Yeah, the KM for both the Arabidopsis and the Selaginella genes are very, very similar, right? But other substrates have different KM. So the KM of the Selaginella protein to these two, two substrates is much lower than it is in Arabidopsis, okay. So, based on this, the kinetic information, the answer to this question, are there alternative routes to making selaginella, uh, S-lignin and selaginella? The answer is yes. Okay, so based on these kinetic properties and other things that I won't go into, um, this is the uh, abbreviated version of the phenylpropanoid pathway. So, here's phenylalanine, so purple, are the genes that, or the proteins that would be part of the pathway that is in common between Selaginella and Arabidopsis, okay? And then if you look at the flow of this, this particular pathway, Arabidopsis goes this way, makes S-lignin here or G-lignin here, and then Selaginella on the other hand, they propose anyway, that Selaginella actually goes this way, and it actually makes H-lignin as well as S lignin. Okay. Does that make sense? So there is an alternative way for selaginella to make S lignin compared to Arabidopsis. And then what we, further what was really interesting is that based on the kinetics, right, F5H hydroxylates this and this, right, to give you that in that. The selaginella protein, okay, actually acts in two parts of the pathway. So the Arabidopsis protein cannot do this activity, whereas the Selaginella protein can, okay? And because the Selaginella protein has this activity, they proposed that they thought, well, it's gonna produce a lot of H lignin, um, which is another form of lignin that is either absent in angiosperms or present in very, very, very low concentrations, right? So sure enough, they went and measured lignin and found that um, selaginella makes a lot of H-lignin. Now, how that affects 
the ability of lignin to be degraded um, is unknown at this time. But I think it really is kind of cool because it shows how you can use evolution to pull out genes and actually modify something as basic as the lignin composition in, in, um, in angiosperms. Okay. How are doing my time? Good. So this, these lignin synthesis proteins, a lot of them are P450s. And the other story, a little story I want to tell you about is just this, these, the diversity of, meta, of genes and of proteins involved in metabolic pathways and what we've learned by comparing the genomes of Fiscomitrella, which is a moss, Selaginella, and Arabidopsis. Okay, first of all, you'll see that, let's go to Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis has a total of 425 P450s. This is a lot, a lot more than we as humans have, right? Um, and a lot of these are very important in making this plethora of plant secondary compounds that one finds in plants. And what's interesting is that Fiscomitrella, which is a tetraploid, only has 71 genes, and you can see that Slaginella has almost as many P450s as does Arabidopsis, okay? And the same is true with these BADH acyl transferases, which are also um, proteins involved in the biosynthesis of these secondary compounds, as well as terpene synthases. So when you're mowing your lawn and you smell that stuff, those are terpenes, okay? So other plant secondary compounds. You can see that Fisco doesn't, Fisco is a representative of a non-vascular land plant, does not have so many genes compared to Selaginella and Arabidopsis. Now we don't know what a lot of these functions are, um, but if you look at the phylogenetic trees, and this is just one example of one P450 clan, um, F5H, one that P450 that's involved in lignin biosynthesis is in this particular clan. It's really, this is really cool, I think, because what you can see is that in this clan, these are all Arabidopsis genes. So there's this huge irradi radiation of P450s in the angiosperm lineage, right? And there is an independent radiation of P450s within this clan, right, in the Selaginella, in the lycophyte lineage. Okay, so we, of course, we don't know what the functions of these particular proteins are, but I think it's, it's sim you can, one can conclude that the repertoire of plant secondary compounds that are made in Selaginella are going to be probably equal to, as, at least as abundance, but they're probably going to be very, very different from what one finds in angiosperms. Okay. So, those are my little Slaginella stories. And as far as the present and future is concerned, I mapped out here the number of complete genome sequences on this green plant tree of life. And you can see we have lots and lots of angiosperm sequences, whole, or genome sequences. We now have one lycophyte sequence. We have one bryophyte, a moss sequence and two chlorophytes. I, this, this number may be incorrect, I'm not really sure. Well, what we don't have are the caraphytes, which would be really, really cool because they are the sister group to the, all of the land plants. And we do not have a fern sequence. And I, I believe there's a gymnosperm sequence being done, Pinus. And ferns are really, really cool. I'm just gonna give you one example. This is Terris vitata the arsenic-eating fern. These ferns do incredible and remarkable things that no angiosperm does. So this, I'm just using this as an example, but it is the only multicellular organism that is capable of tolerating and hyperaccumulating arsenic. So if you take a frond, an, a, a plant that's been grown in arsenate, over 2% of the dry weight of that frond is inorganic arsenite, incredibly toxic, okay. So, you know, how did this trait evolve? So we've been, we've been studying this and we've been finding that a lot of the genes that are involved in this particular trait just are not in Arabidopsis. So, you know, that's one example, I think, of why we should be studying ferns. This is one other example. Um, these are gametophytes. 
of one particular fern. And what's really interesting about this is that the sex of this gametophyte, not only for this fern, for, but for almost all ferns, is epigenetically regulated by its social environment. So it's actually like a fish in a sense, okay? So in this case, in this particular fern, um, you have a single spore. It develops always when it's by itself. It develops as a hermaphrodite. The hermaphrodite secretes a pheromone. So then another spore that grows in the presence of this pheromone becomes a male. Okay. So sex determination, these are very, very different looking, right? Is it's totally regulated epigenetically. There's no genetic difference between the hermaphrodite and the male. So this is a really um, nice system for understanding environmental sex determination mechanisms because this is also a haploid organism which can be easily mutagenized. It's like working with yeast. You can mutagenize it's like mutants um, and do a lot of genetic analyses. So anyway, and, and the only point I want to make here is that these ferns are doing really, really interesting things and they're doing things that you would never find in any angiosperm. Okay, you couldn't study these, this, these phenomenon in, in angiosperms. So with that, let's sequence a fern, okay? <laughs> so I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. <laughs> Any questions for, for Jody? Jim. Oh, no. You may have said this, but is uh, S. lignin synthesis un unique to Selaginella amongst the lycophytes, or do other lycophytes make it? And do you think it's arisen independent? The pathways arisen independently, it's, or they, have just been lost in the other? No, other it's pro no, ferns do not. The ones that have been surveyed, anyway. So ferns don't. Gymnosperms don't. Podocarpus does, which is uh, another gymnosperm. So it seems, and if you look at the phylogenetic trees of these P450s, um, they are not homologs, these two, the protein from the um, Selaginella and Arabidopsis, they're not homologs. So that suggests independent evolution. So it seems that plants have invented multiple times ways of making S. lignin rather than being lost. Yes. Yeah, a follow, a fully a follow-up on that of, and this is far beyond the scope of genomics. Yeah. Um, in sort of the S, with the have the S to G, since S is often thought to be one of the more recalcitrant and difficult, do you think that it sort of falls in the lost lineages? Is that part of why it's been so well sequestered for millions and millions and millions of years so we can now burn it all up? <laughs> um, well, I can't answer that. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> um, I get it. Well, that, that really falls on what Jim was saying. If, if, if it was a lost trait from yeah. the fam, from that, that group, then probably not. If it was a recently added, it, the things, these are the yeah. questions you now could look at. Right. Could, right. is it recently added right. that it now makes S right. or is it lost from all the others? Right. right. And, in, and that, that was the clue I'd be starting to look for, for this. Right as to how to start going. Otherwise, you're gonna to have to talk to either engineers like me or coal chemists and start seeing how does that translate into those of fossil beds of the right, ancient right. lineages. Yeah, so I think they looked at, Jenga looked at like a podium and it does not make S. lignin. So I don't know what's weird about Selaginella compared to, well, there's only three lycophytes, you know, so I don't, I'm not sure why yeah, but it with would, a fresh with a fresh genome yeah. and with not much comparative, that's where you get to right. comparative exactly. genomes to see whether exactly. it's lost or gained. Exactly. And that's, exactly. I know that's premature, but that right. that would be where to answer that question. Right. That's where I'd be looking for your expertise to lead, lead towards yeah, some yeah, clues. Yeah, yeah, but I'll I'll, I'll let Clint know you're interested. In it. <laughs> yeah. So. Thank you very much, Jody. Okay.